Hello and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It is October 25th, 2019. And today we're going to be discussing William Taylor's testimony, how to halt global warming for only 300 billion, Exxon's trial for lying about the climate crisis, and the recently passed bill in the House cracking down on anonymous shell companies. And on the technology front, we'll speak about Google's quantum supremacy. So diving right into it today, the United States top Ukrainian diplomat, William Taylor, shared some pretty damning testimony this past Tuesday about Donald Trump's coercion of the Ukrainian government. Prior to the testimony, the Trump team stressed that there was absolutely no quid pro quo with Ukraine. A quid pro quo is when someone is offered something uh, in exchange for something else, a mutual bargain, a trade, if you will. But according to U.S. law code number 30121, the United States prohibits a person working for a foreign government from, and I quote, making a contribution or donation of money or other thing of value related to a U.S. election. It also makes it illegal for people to ask for or receive contributions of any kind of value from someone within a foreign government. So just to make it absolutely clear, the law as stated today, makes it illegal to ask for this type of arrangement. William Taylor's full testimony, which is linked below in the description, makes it very clear that a crime was committed. Uh, detailed notes from his phone calls, his texts, his meetings, explained how Donald Trump was aggravating years of U.S. foreign policy work in Ukraine for his own personal re-election campaign. Taylor testified that military aid to Ukraine and an in-person meeting between Donald Trump and Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, were contingent on Zelensky's publicly announcing two investigations, one into Joe Biden's son Hunter uh, and his board seat on a Ukrainian gas company called Burisma, and another into allegations of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 elections. So Trump would not even meet with Ukraine, a United Nations ally, unless the president agreed to the demands. Now, I'm not denying the shadiness of Hunter Biden having a board seat on a Ukrainian gas company. That, that's a form of soft corruption, and I'm happy that Biden was exposed. But both of these cases rely on totally unfounded allegations that have been mainly pushed by far-right propaganda machines. There really is no legal case for the investigations, which makes the quid pro quo even worse. Now, I should clarify, Trump's eject new funds. He just interfered with an established agreement to dig up dirt on his political opponent, Joe Biden. Taylor named names, citing then Special Envoy Kurt Volker, Ambassador Sondland, and Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, and the President's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. There are a number of instances naming the four in the testimony, but, but some of the highlights are, Sunland purportedly told Yermak that the military aid, and I quote, would not come until President Zelensky committed to pursue the Burisma investigation. The plan was to have Attorney General Bill Barr and Ukraine's general prosecutor, uh, the, the plan was that they would make a joint statement together about the investigations into potential interference in the 2016 elections. That didn't happen, obviously. It seems as though the writing is on the wall for Donald Trump and, and not much more needs to be said. Whether or not he'll be impeached, that, that's an entirely different thing. Um, one thing we can likely count on is his attempts to rile up and enrage his base further throughout the process. It's a topic we've discussed at length, so I, I won't dive into it in today's episode, but progressives, I'll offer one piece of perspective and advice as we navigate through this next year. Let's leave with love. You know, we're, we're all in this together, whether or not we like it. Um, we're all extensions of the same universe dealing with the histories that we have inherited. And, and we're going to have to deal uh, with Trump's core base after Trump. And I think that's really important that we kind of lead with love and into this process and lead with inclusivity and, and find a way to kind of bring these people back into the fold. Uh, because we're going to have to deal with them. They're, they're you know, not a small fringe minority. It's a, it's a you know, 20 to 30 percent. Of, uh, of Trump's base, so it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Moving on, the climate scientists at the United Nations have determined that the amount of money needed to stop the rise of greenhouse gases and give humanity up to 20 years to fix global warming is 300 billion. 
Now, for most of us, myself included, that, that number might as well be infinity. It, it's really hard to conceptualize. But to put it in context, $300 billion is the gross domestic product of Chile or the world's military spending every 60 days. In other words, the goal is completely achievable. Now, the money isn't destined for new technology. It's actually going back to a tried and true practice to lock in millions of tons of carbon back into the soil. Uh, Baron J. Orr, a lead scientist at the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, said, we have lost the biological function of soils. We have got to reverse that. If we do it, we are turning the land into a big part of the solution for climate change. The report goes on to describe how 2 billion hectares of land on the planet have essentially been degraded because of human misuse. Uh, returning that land to pasture uh, for food crops or trees would convert enough carbon into biomass to stabilize emissions of CO2, the biggest greenhouse gas, for 15 to 20 years, giving the world time to adapt to carbon-neutral technologies and really giving the technologies time to catch up to the actual needs uh, that we have. The central goal is to fight desertification of our land, something that will be even more accelerated with the climate crisis. Eduardo Mansour, director of the Land and Water Division at the Food and Agriculture Organization said, the main cause of emissions from agriculture is poor land management, but the solutions are known, sustainable land management, sustainable water management, and sustainable soil management. So to be clear, he's isn't talking about reclaiming deserts. He's not saying we're going to go into existing deserts and we're going to try and terraform them into something else. He's talking about restoring wasteland that was productive before human intervention. So an example might be in the Brazilian rainforest, they slash and burn the forest, the cattle's graze, but when the cows are done, they literally leave the land. It's, it's cheaper. Uh, we had talked about that in a previous progress report. So what he's saying is let's invest in reinvesting in that land because the land is fertile. It's just about you know, how we as humans treat it after we're done with it. Uh, I have to admit, I am excited about this prospect because it's something we don't hear too much about, which is using the resilient power of the earth to help restore the planet. We've seen it time and time again. When we support the planet by planting new life and supporting species, there is a profound revitalization of the earth and that area that, that gets that kind of attention. So it's a really exciting proposal and I would hope that our global leadership sees uh, both the sensibility and the achievability of this plan. Uh, you know, of course, the question is going to be raised, how are we going to pay for it? As if the security of global life could warrant any price tag too high to act. But it does segue nicely into our next topic, which is that New York's attorney general is accusing ExxonMobil of lying to investors about how profitable the company will remain as governments impose stricter regulations to combat global warming. The lawsuit claims the Texas energy giant kept two sets of books, one accounting for climate change regulations and the other underestimating the costs to make the company appear more valuable to investors. And, and the trial began this past Tuesday. Uh, this is a pretty big case for those of us who are passionate about the climate crisis because the result will set the tone for other lawsuits around the country. It's already been revealed that Exxon knew about the impact their fuel extraction was having on the planet and concealed that information from both investors and the public. In the quest for more profits, they accelerated their activities despite the clear and present danger it presents to global humanity. Now, ExxonMobil isn't alone in this deception. Any global energy conglomerate bears the same burden. Now, as progressives, this is a cause that we should all be paying attention to. It's going to set a precedent for how much we can hold energy companies accountable for the damage done to the planet, kind of like it's going to be the next big tobacco. Now, this type of abuse highlights why the gathering of production of energy is an economic vertical that should be under public ownership and control. Energy is essential to nearly every activity humans undertake in present day. When something is central to the function of society, there is absolutely no logic in introducing a profit incentive to the process or you know, allowing an existing profit incentive to continue. It's not like you can make the argument that the CEOs and management were making good decisions and thinking long term. 
it is demonstrably true that they ignored the known consequences in favor of short-term capital gains. When it comes to energy, we need to think long-term with projects that consider the scope of impact globally. We can never have a true system of zero marginal cost energy under the current corporate regimes. And to expand on that, imagine a network of green energy infrastructure from Canada to the United States and then down to Mexico. It's, they're decentralized microgrids, so they essentially um, there's no central base of power, which is great for national security. Um, and what they do is they feed excess power collected where it needs to go most, using intelligent software to route that power. The argument for a, a near zero marginal cost economy comes from Jeremy Rifkin, which essentially says, once we develop this type of infrastructure and we have this energy revolution and we combine an energy revolution with our communications revolution, that is the internet, um, that will help humanity take an emergent leap, kind of like the industrial revolution. Um, it, it allows us to really transcend our current position and dive into a whole new realm of technology and experience. But corporations aren't interested in these type of next generation solutions as they destroy their existing profit models. Any arguments suggesting that privatization creates efficiencies and innovation are also null and void. If that was the case, ExxonMobil would be the leader in green energy technology today. Instead, we know that they chose to extract capital from existing business models instead of innovating in new and needed directions. I want to take a brief aside. I didn't mention it in the introduction, but if you're not aware, Edward Snowden of the NSA whistleblower fame um, was recently interviewed for over two hours on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. I've, I've linked it below in the description. Um, I highly recommend you check it out, if nothing else, but to refresh yourself on why Edward Snowden is a national hero. He discusses his history, his actions, and the thought process at some length, including what led him to expose the deep corruption at the expense of, of literally his life and everything he knows. Um, you should totally check it out. Moving on, this past Tuesday, the House passed H.R. 2513, the Corporate Transparency Act, with bipartisan support. It was originally proposed by Carolyn Maloney of New York, Tom Malinowski of New Jersey, and Peter King of New York. Uh, and the Corporate Transparency Act is designed to require companies to disclose their true beneficial owners at the time the company is formed to prevent bad actors from using anonymous shell companies to thwart law enforcement and hide their illicit activities. You know, what the bill does is it requires the corporations and limited liability corporations, LLCs, um, to disclose their true owners to FinCEN at the time the company is formed. It establishes a minimum beneficial ownership disclosure requirements, uh, and they must provide beneficial owners names, date of births, current addresses, and driver's licenses or non-expired passport numbers. It requires companies to annually file a list of current beneficial owners, as well as a list of any changes to beneficial ownership that occurred during the previous year. And it provides civil and criminal penalties for persons who willfully submit false or fraudulent beneficial ownership information, or who knowingly fail to provide complete or updated beneficial ownership information. The objective is to provide transparency while avoiding excessive burdens. Um, beneficial ownership information collected by the Treasury or the states will only be available to law enforcement and financial institutions, so it's not available to the public, um, with customer consent uh, for purposes of complying with the quote-unquote know your customer requirements under the anti-money laundering law. It's narrowly tailored so as not to become overly burdensome to either businesses or the states themselves, but the bill really targets companies that are more likely to be shell companies. Uh, many companies are already required to disclose their beneficial owners, such as federally regulated banks, credit unions, investment advisors, broker dealers, uh, state regulated insurance companies, churches, and charitable organizations. And as such, these companies are exempt from the bill's requirements. Also, companies with over 20 employees and over $5 million in gross receipts and sales, uh, which have a physical presence in the United States, are also exempt from the bill's requirements because companies that employ this many people and have legitimate business-related income are very unlikely to be anonymous shell companies that we are you know, trying to hide or uh, launder illicit funds. And that's really what the bill seems to be focused on. The bill addresses the issues revealed in the Panama Papers back in 2016, 
uh, where 11.5 million leaked documents detailed the financial and attorney client information for more than uh, 214,000 offshore entities. The leak showed the world how the uber wealthy were sheltering their money from government taxation, which is a practice that diminishes social programs and leads to further concentration of wealth. Now, I'm not super familiar with the intricacies of corporate law and corporate tax law and shell companies, so I won't comment towards that. But I will comment uh, that the bill lacks a retroactive method of recuperating funds lost, which I think is a larger reflection on how white collar crime is dealt with in the United States. Activities that are technically legal but extremely detrimental to a large majority of people occur until they reach a breaking point. After a new legal direction is carved out, the majority of perpetrators move forward without punishment. In the scenarios where the primary perpetrators have high amounts of wealth, there's ample incentive just to find the next loophole to expose. You know, if we're unable or unwilling to set a threshold of retroactive punishments for white collar financial crimes, we will forever be unable to create a genuine method of dissuading people from acting with ill intent. Now, this is a gray area, so I present the concept as something for further discussion and thought from all of us. Retroactive punishment can be a dangerous thing uh, used for ill intention in the wrong hand, so we'd want to make sure that the definition was narrow, isolated to these white-collar financial crimes, as they typically are seen as victimless crimes. Now, as a society, if we're unable to imagine alternatives to preventing white-collar crime, we are doomed to see it repeat. White collar financial crimes create incredible benefits for very low risks for the people involved. Now compare that to incarcerating a youth or a young person of color for having an eighth of weed and the long term damage that does to their educational and employment opportunities. Criminal justice reform is a priority of every progressive everywhere. Uh, we have two sets of laws in this country and that has been inherited throughout the centuries. I want to wrap up this week's progress report with some new technology news. This week, Google formally announced it had achieved quantum supremacy. Now, the claim is challenged by IBM, who in their quest for quantum computing is pursuing a different set of milestones. So they're essentially saying that Google's milestones aren't theirs and therefore it's not supremacy. But today we'll focus on what Google is saying uh, in their recent AI blog. The landmark achievement surpassed prior experiments that showed that quantum mechanics work as expected up to a state space dimension of about 1000. Now Google expanded the test to a size of 10 quadrillion and found that everything still works as expected. Now the company believes that this experiment shows that there are no unexpected physics that will degrade the performance of their quantum computer and they're going to, they plan to continue to scale their efforts. The big takeaway from this, randomness. According to their blog, Google has developed the first widely useful quantum algorithm for computer science applications, certifiable quantum randomness. Randomness is an important resource in computer science and quantum randomness is the gold standard, especially if the numbers can be self-checked or certified uh, to come from a quantum computer. Testing this type of algorithm the testing of this algorithm is still ongoing, uh, and in the coming months, Google plans to implement a prototype that can provide certifiable random numbers. Now, the company intends to open up supremacy class processors available to collaborators and academic researchers, as well as companies that are interested in developing algorithms and searching for application uh, for today's NISQ processors. Long term, they envision this discovery leading to help design new materials, for example, like lightweight batteries for cars and airplanes, new catalysts that can produce fertilizer more efficiently, a process that today produces over 2% of the world's carbon emissions, uh, and more effective medicines. Now, they admit that achieving the necessary computational capabilities will still require years of hard engineering and scientific work, but they're excited to move ahead. And, and personally, I love reading these things. It supports the philosophy that you, despite all the strife of present day, technology is likely to provide us a pathway forward that given present time seem unimaginable. And, and that's a future worth looking forward to. Of course, as progressives, we need to ensure the equity of those solutions get distributed in a fair way and not just to the current majority capital holders, but that's a you know, discussion for another day. 
So that concludes another episode of the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. Once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and I want to take a quick moment just to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels. All it takes is about three seconds of your time and one mouse click, but it really makes a difference. Your support goes a long way in our shared desire to just deeply explore and question the present times we're living in. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.